Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 210, A Renaissance Prince. Henry VIII succeeded to the throne in 1509 to great acclaim. He had all the virtues expected of a Renaissance prince. Yet by the time he died in 1547, Henry's reputation was that of a tyrant, a Renaissance era Caligula whose hands were soaked in the blood of the many people he had executed, including two of his wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Henry VIII is certainly the best-known English king in worldwide popular imagination. From numerous biographies to the HBO series The Tudors, Henry VIII is consistently portrayed as a larger-than-life figure. And in many ways, he was. However, some of his reputation needs to be re-examined. There is so much surviving source material for his reign that, at times, we know almost too much about Henry. In preparing these episodes, I digested no less than five major works on Henry VIII, and that still left the shelf mostly full at the bookstore. No English sovereign has ever owned so many houses as Henry. None had a lifestyle so deliberately fashioned to enhance his own prestige. And, obviously, none had quite so many wives. Yet, as I hope to show in these episodes, Henry was much more than the husband to six different queens. And nor was his desire to remarry so consistently driven by some insatiable sexual appetite. If you liked the TV show, The Tudors, as I did at times, you might be confused by that last statement. But it's true. Henry was not as sex-crazed as his popular culture image makes him out to be. Nor did he function in a vacuum. England was an important and wealthy kingdom in 1509. But it was certainly not the only kingdom in Europe, and definitely not the most important. I hope also in this series to put Henry in context with the other two major power players in Europe at the time, Francis I and Charles V. Of course, even that stance completely ignores the Ottomans and Eastern Europe, who I promise we're going to get back to after all this. While I am no historian, I do hope I can do Henry some justice. So today I want to look at the very beginning of King Henry VIII's reign and talk for a while about several aspects of his kingship in general before we get to the really good stuff. Now, as always, if you're interested in more content, check out the links in the show notes. The link to the website is on there, the Patreon account which will offer you ad-free versions of the show, and then a brand new subscription feed. We're all the way past the ancient Egyptians and Sumerians in the subscription feed, and well on into the Babylonians and Hittites, if you want round two. I have no fear, but when you have heard that our prince, now Henry VIII, whom we may call our Octavius, had succeeded to his father's throne, all your melancholy left you at once. What may you not promise yourself from a prince whose extraordinary and almost divine character you are acquainted? When you know that a hero, he now shows himself how wisely he behaves, what a lover he is, of justice and goodness, what affection he bears to the learned. I will venture to swear that you will need no wings to make you fly to behold this new and auspicious star. If you could see here how all the world is rejoicing in the possession of so great a prince, how his life is all their desire, you could not contain your tears for sheer joy. The heavens laugh, the earth exults. Avarice is expelled from the country 
extortion is put down. Liberality scatters riches with a bountiful hand. Yet our king does not desire gold, gems, or precious metals, but virtue, glory, and immortality. Desiderius Erasmus, April 22nd, 1509. The contrast between Henry VIII and his now-dead father could not have been more immediately apparent. Henry VIII was proclaimed the King of England on April the 22nd, 1509, an apt day to celebrate a new age, as it was also St. George's Day. To his contemporaries, Henry VIII was the embodiment of good kingship. Thomas More at his coronation stated that, quote, Among a thousand noble companions, the king stands out the tallest, and his strength fits his majestic body. There is a fiery power in his cheeks, beauty in his face, and the color of twin roses in his cheeks. War was not embellishing much. Henry was a big guy. He stood over six feet two inches tall, well over the average height for 1509. Everyone remarked how much he resembled his grandfather, Edward VI, with a broad face, small, penetrating eyes, and a slight, sensual mouth. The comparisons, unfortunately for Henry, between himself and Edward IV would continue as he aged. The young Henry was full of energy. According to his physicians, he was, quote, never still or quiet. He was quick to laugh and enjoyed practical jokes very much. In 1509, at least, he was described as, quote, prudent, sage, and free from every vice, end quote. As he ascended the throne, Henry was absolutely idealistic, open-handed, and liberal. That would change over time. Still, decision-making did not come easily to Henry. He preferred, quote, to sleep and dream upon the matter and give an answer in the morning. But once his mind was made up, it was set in stone. Henry also had an irresistible charm about him. Sir Thomas More wrote of the young man, quote, The king has a way of making every man feel that he is enjoying his special favor. Erasmus described him as, quote, most full of heart. Henry was a young man when he ascended the throne. He was not quite 18 years old. As a result, Lady Margaret Beaufort acted as regent, technically, during the first ten weeks of his reign. After the king, no one held more lands than Lady Margaret. Then again, at 66, she had outlived four husbands and her son, Henry VII. Henry came to the throne as certainly the best educated English monarch in the history of the kingdom. He had been taught in the classical, humanist fashion. Thomas More later asked, quote, What may we not expect from a king who has been nourished on philosophy and the nine muses? End quote. Henry, as we will see, was in good company. Most monarchs in Europe were now educated men. But Henry had gone out of his way to make sure he was well-educated. He showed a flair for languages at an early age. By the time he became king in 1509, he was fluent in French, English, and Latin. And he had a pretty good command of Italian as well. Later on, he acquired some Spanish, probably from his wife, Catherine. He also had an aptitude for music, which seems to have been something of a Tudor family trait. Erasmus, who was by no means a court sycophant, called Henry a, quote, universal genius. Not a bad epithet. Sir Thomas More claimed, the king's majesty has more learning than any other English monarch possessed before him. Certainly More was right. Beyond academics, Henry was creative and inventive. He loved novelties and enjoyed experimenting with mechanics and technology. In all the many houses he acquired, Henry would insist on having the latest in technological advances. A king's first duty, and the one that Henry would obsess over his entire reign, 
was to produce a son and heir. To that end, Henry immediately decided he would marry Catherine of Aragon, his brother's widow, to whom he had been technically engaged since 1503. Catherine was Henry's equal in many ways. Like him, she had been classically educated and was especially well-read in the scriptures. Erasmus would later tell the king, quote, Your wife spends that time in reading the sacred volume that other princesses occupy in cards and dice. And Erasmus thought very highly of Catherine. He wrote that she was, quote, miraculously learned for a woman, end quote. In fact, Erasmus thought Catherine was a better scholar than her husband was. Physically, in her youth, Catherine had been described as, quote, the most beautiful creature in the world. Of course, she was princess, so no one's going to say otherwise. She was short and plump, but her bearing was regal and dignified. She had a very fair complexion, which was a rarity among Spaniards at the time, with gray eyes and auburn hair. Catherine might have appeared serene and submissive on the outside. Within, however, she had a resolute will and a single-minded tenacity. And her religious convictions were intense. Someone wrote she was, quote, as religious and virtuous as words can express. And I do not doubt the authenticity or accuracy of that statement. Her piety was orthodox and deep. Catherine regularly spent hours every day at her devotions. The queen confessed her sins every week and received the Eucharist on Sundays. Not to overly quote the man, but just to give you a contemporary sense, according to Erasmus, Catherine was a, quote, brilliant example of her sex. In June 1509, the young king brought Catherine to Greenwich Palace, where the two were to be married. Of all of his palaces, Henry VIII had a special place in his heart for Greenwich. During the first half of his reign, he spent more time there than any of his other houses. And so, at Greenwich Palace, King Henry and Queen Catherine were finally married on June the 11th, 1509. Henry was fond of telling people at the time that he, quote, loved true where he did marry, and wrote to Catherine's father, quote, if I were still free, I would choose her for wife before all others. Obviously, we have no way of knowing how genuine Henry's feelings for Catherine were. That being said, at least early on in their marriage, we don't have any evidence to suggest that the king did not have anything but warm feelings for his queen. Remember, royal marriages at the time were not supposed to be great romantic love affairs. Marriage was about European diplomacy, and Spain was a kingdom on the rise. I do not doubt for one second that, in 1509, Henry thought anything other than that his marriage to Catherine was in his and England's best interests. The fact that his opinion would change over time should not alter our view of the marriage at the moment. We know that Catherine adored Henry. She referred to him variously as your grace, my husband, and even my Henry. Henry VIII inherited a massive, massive fortune from his parsimonious father. Historians estimate this fortune at 1,250,000 pounds, probably in the neighborhood of 375 million pounds in today's currency. His kingdom, quote, this fertile and plentiful realm of England, at this time flourishing in all abundance of wealth and riches and grace, and plenty reigned within it, end quote. In other words, 
the England Henry VIII took over was in a much better position than the one taken over by his father in 1485. Henry VIII was the envy of European monarchs. Both Francis I and Charles V would inherit kingdoms very much in debt. Henry, Henry had cash to spend. Oh, and spend he would. On June the 24th, 1509, Henry and Catherine made their way to Westminster Abbey, where Henry was formally crowned. The celebrations lasted for several days. Quote, To further enhance the triumphal coronation, jousts and tourneys were held in the grounds of the Palace of Westminster. For the comfort of the royal spectators, a pavilion was constructed, covered with tapestries and hung with rich heiress cloth. And nearby there was a curious fountain, over which was built a sort of castle, with an imperial crown on the top, and battlements of roses and gilded pomegranates. Its walls were painted white with green lozenges, each containing a rose, a pomegranate, a quiver of arrows, or the letters H and K, all gilded. The shields of the arms of the jousters also appeared on the walls, and on certain days red, white, and claret wine ran from the mouths of the castle's gargoyles. The organizers of all this were Thomas Howard, heir to the Earl of Surrey, Admiral Sir Edward Howard, his brother, Lord Richard Grey, Sir Edmund Howard, Sir Thomas Kivett, and Sir Brandon, Esquire. The trumpets sounded and the fresh young gallants and the noblemen took the field. All the participants were magnificently attired. End quote. In the end, the only thing that could stop these festivities was a death. Lady Margaret Beaufort finally passed away on June the 29th, 1509. She had done more than anyone else to bring alive the Tudor dynasty. Luckily, Henry had just attained the age of majority. So with his grandmother dead, Henry VIII proceeded to rule on his own. Kings, even in the early modern period, were still considered to be semi-divine beings. A king was not just a normal man. He was considered to be God's anointed servant. To rebel against the king was tantamount to rebelling against God himself. As God's deputy on earth, kings ruled, quote, by divine right, a phrase that would take on much more meaning in the coming century. Since medieval times, kings were seen as made up of two entities, a mortal entity and what was called, quote, the king's person. The king's person represented unending royal authority. That's the royal we everyone talks about. The part of kingship that is passed on to successors. Henry would tell his judges that, quote, kings of England never had any superior but God. So sacrosanct was the institution of monarchy that it was seen as a sacrilege even to criticize the acts of the sovereign. The king, literally, could do no wrong. But at least according to Henry, with this great power came great responsibility. The king had an extraordinary responsibility toward his subjects. Still, Henry assumed that God was his ally and that God wished his fairs to succeed. Now, technically, the Tudor monarchs were not absolute rulers. But all parts of the government, from parliament to the various officers of state, everyone exercised authority in the king's name. And the Tudors would elevate the monarchy to new heights of power. Their prestige was enhanced by elaborate ceremonies, which permeated every aspect of their public existence. This calculated aura had a name, Majestas, or Magnificence. The goal was to create an illusion of wealth and power, perhaps in excess of what actually existed. I do say perhaps on purpose. I mean, there's a lot of things that the king can do, 
Now, we might think in the mold of what we think of when I say the words like Roman emperor and English kings, that these kings always sought to promote their majestas. But in actuality, it was not until Edward IV that anybody sought to emulate some of the more ostentatious courts of Europe. Henry, in fact, to a large extent, was just aping the court of the Valois in Burgundy, which set the standard for Renaissance-style courts. The Italian writer Castiglione, in his book The Courtier, stated that the perfect ruler, quote, should be a prince of splendor and generosity, giving freely to everyone. He should hold magnificent banquets, festivals, games, and public shows. Henry VIII absolutely lived up to this ideal. He was the first English king rich enough to lavish money on palaces, clothes, entertainments, and a lifestyle which gave truth to Castiglione's words. Henry had a knack, at least early in his reign, for finding effective servants, notably Cardinal Wolsey and Thomas Cromwell. But while Henry was happy to delegate many of the tasks he preferred not to spend his time on, There is no doubt that, honestly, up until the very end of his life, Henry and Henry alone was in control. Henry loved his diversions, don't get me wrong, but he was determined to be the man in charge of the English state. He even once said, quote, If my cap knew my counsel, I would throw it in the fire. Henry was never afraid to take on anyone throughout his reign if they attempted to challenge his authority nor was he afraid to take an advisor down a few pegs or a few inches by separating their head from their shoulders if they displeased him or overstepped their bounds. Henry made no mystery about his continental ambitions when he came to power. He was utterly determined that England should play a more prominent role in European politics. One of his first announcements after the death of his father was his intention to invade France and, ideally, recoup the losses at the end of the Hundred Years' War. In 1509, a Venetian ambassador commented, quote, The new king is magnificent, liberal, and a great enemy of the French. End quote. Henry's whole reason for marrying Catherine was to gain Ferdinand as an ally against the French, though, in the end, he would be disappointed. The English people supported him in these endeavors, at least in theory. Nationalism in Europe was on the rise, and England was no exception. In 1513, an Italian wrote, quote, He is very popular with his own people, and indeed with all, for all of his qualities. Henry was, in so many ways, exactly what England needed in 1509. And his popularity never waned even during his reforms and even after his reign, takes a cruel turn. The people in general always loved him. While we might marvel at the ostentatious glamour of Henry's court, do not for a moment forget that wherever Henry was, was also the seat of the English government. It would be the political and cultural hub of the nation. The court was the place to be for anyone trying to get royal favor. Consequently, there was no shortage of random sycophants running around the periphery of the court. These quote-unquote strangers were a constant issue. Many courtiers brought many more servants, relatives, and friends than was technically permitted. Strangers were not only a security risk. They appropriated food and lodgings to which they were not entitled. But Quite frankly, this was a problem that was impossible to control. The sergeant who manned the gates only had five yeomen of the guard to help him. Thus, there was no way to regulate who was coming in and out 24-7. In terms of said courtiers, their status was largely determined by their proximity to the king. The closer you were, the more important you were. Just like the closer to the sun you are, the warmer you are. Sometimes... Petitioners could get lucky enough to present their claims and requests directly to the king, 
and according to Tudor lore, Henry was in his best mood when he was about to go hunting. So, that, everyone said, was when it was best to request something. But Henry was no fool. He knew that most men who spoke with him wanted something. But throughout his reign, Henry remained quite open-handed with gifts and honors, and successive ministers did what they could to curb this financially ruinous good nature. Henry's successive marriages brought different families to prominence at different times. But these factions were rarely stable, and this fact accounts for the truly epic amount of backstabbing at the court of King Henry VIII. Life at court could also be boring. There was a lot of hanging around and waiting at any court, and Henry's was no exception. His court was also horrifyingly wasteful. In the winter, it was not uncommon for as many as 1,500 people to be at court, even though only around 100 actually had access to Henry. Many of the people at court had to be housed and fed, which was the job of the Lord Chamberlain. He decided who received bouche de court, which was a daily allowance of bread, wine, beer, candles, and firewood. These rations were, of course, according to rank. Those not entitled received just their wages. By and large, most of the people at court were male, and probably fewer than 100 at any given moment were women. Different queens kept different households throughout Henry's reign and throughout his different wives, but the household of the queen was separate from that of the king. Upon her marriage, Henry assigned Catherine a household of 160, many of whom were female. Still, Catherine's household was rarely present at court unless needed. Catherine kept a tight ship and had high standards for her servants, as we will see. Gentlemen who waited upon Henry were also entitled to lodging. Courtier lodgings were of two types, double and single. As the name suggests, double lodgings had two rooms. The basic difference was whether or not you got a stool chamber. Single room occupants had to use the public latrines. Each courtier who received lodgings was responsible for providing his own furniture and keeping the room clean. Aspiring courtiers who had not been allocated lodgings had to ask for permission to come to court. Every record that we have suggests the opposite of what we might think of when it comes to behavior at the court of King Henry VIII. It turned out it wasn't all roast turkey legs and wine. Henry tried to keep strict rules for behavior, in fact. We know by comparison, his court was a lot less licentious than that of Francis I in Paris. This doesn't mean that Henry was chaste. It just means he was a lot more discreet than some of his counterparts. Of course, there was a double standard in all of this. Men were expected to indulge, while women had to remain above reproach, a formula which was clearly impossible. Henry was passionately committed to the idea of medieval chivalry. He was fascinated with tales of the Knights of the Round Table, though it wasn't until the Reformation began that he used his alleged connection to King Arthur as a justification for a burgeoning English empire. In many of his later relationships, especially with Anne Boleyn, Henry styled himself as a knight errant in the old courtly tradition, often ending his letters with a cipher. Catherine also exerted a civilizing influence on court. She expected her ladies to behave as she did. Together with Henry, Catherine worked hard to create the semblance of a virtuous environment. And often they succeeded in creating an actual virtuous environment. Again, contrary to the popular imagination. 
Henry VIII would own more homes than any English monarch. Little remains today, unfortunately, of the splendor of these Tudor palaces. But they must have been magnificent, especially given that wherever Henry was became the seat of English government for whatever period of time he remained there. 16th century contemporaries wrote that Henry was, quote, a perfect builder of pleasant palaces and, quote, the only phoenix of his time for fine and curious masonry. Henry wanted to see palaces in his lifetime, making him a very demanding employer. He often worked his men through the night by candlelight so that his punishing schedule might be met. Many of the best men employed by Henry were not English. During his reign, Parliament would pass three different laws limiting the influx of foreign craftsmen into England by prohibiting them from practicing their trade. Henry, however, made sure the crown was exempt from these restrictions so that he might employ whomever he wished. Of course, Henry's various marriages also kept whole armies of these men employed, as the different coats of arms of his different paramours had to be repeatedly replaced. Within these palaces, Henry lived in a world of excess. In Tudor England, if you had wealth, you flaunted it. The interior decor was rich, vivid, and gaudy. Everything was carefully crafted to catch the eye and transfix the beholder. One thing that probably would surprise us if we were to make a 16th century visit to King Henry's court would have been the lack of furniture. Henry's court, as I already mentioned, was huge. There needed to be room for everyone to fit. Hence, space was at a premium, and so there was little to no furniture. To get from house to house, Henry rode a horse. The roads of Tudor England left much to be desired, especially as most were just old Roman roads that hadn't been much improved since the Romans left over a millennium earlier. The maintenance of these roads in Tudor England was left to the local landowner, so most without any incentive, did not bother to keep them up at all. When around London, Henry always preferred to travel by barge, as such was much faster, easier, and vastly more comfortable. It might surprise you to learn that Henry was a very clean man. He wanted old food cleared immediately and tried to regulate disgusting behavior within his court. He was only partially successful. There's plenty of evidence of men relieving themselves on the walls of the court, both without and within. Henry's houses themselves were only cleaned once everyone left. Working under the supervision of the keeper and office of works, servants would sweep out the empty house, carry away dirty rushes, and scrub the floor. If we were to time travel back to Henry's day, we would also find personal hygiene decidedly lacking. There was no deodorant. People hung sweet-smelling perfumed balls about their necks to ward off the most of it. Soap was prohibitively expensive for all but the elite. Sadly, also, their fine clothing was all but unwashable and would have stank after a few wearings. Since the reign of Edward IV, the royal household had been divided into two parts. There was the visible part of the court titled, The King's Magnificence. This included everything you would see if you went to court, including the king's royal privy chamber and bedroom. Then there was the House of Providence, which included everything downstairs from storerooms to kitchen. It was the job of the great Lord Chamberlain to coordinate both halves and keep everything running smoothly. 
the Lord Chamberlain, that's a different office, by the way, was in charge of the visible part of court. The Lord Chamberlain was always an experienced nobleman and counselor. His role was both diplomatic and political, and he often counseled the king on matters of state policy. In fact, often the Lord Chamberlain spoke for the king at Parliament. Now, the household itself was headed by the Lord Steward, who was also a senior nobleman, and whose office dated all the way back to Saxon times. He was in charge of the day-to-day affairs of running a great house, hiring and firing of servants, paying of wages, purchasing supplies, so on and so forth. And he was a busy man, because Henry VIII intended to keep a household like no other English king had ever attempted. This meant he had to have a budget like no other English king had ever seen. His father left him a fortune, for sure, but budgeting was not Henry's strong suit, and all of his inheritance was quickly spent. During his reign, Henry had an annual income of around £100,000. That sounds like a lot, but while inflation increased during Henry's reign, his income did not. Moreover, that 100000 is not just Henry's personal spending money. That £100,000 represented the total income for the government and had to pay for everything from his clothing to the cost of maintaining roads to the hefty price tag associated with Henry's wars. The royal household accounted for around one-third of all royal spending. Both Wolsey and Cromwell would try to get a handle on Henry's spending, but frankly, to no avail. Despite devaluing the currency twice, and the windfall that would be the income from all the monastic properties he seized, Henry VIII died in debt. We would probably also be surprised at how lax security was at court. Given the issues of the day and the lack of armed guards, it's actually amazing none of the Tudor monarchs were ever assassinated. The Renaissance kings were supposed to be seen and were supposed to be accessible. Still, there were some precautions. Entry to court, as I already mentioned, was controlled by the sergeant porter. He was supposed to search everyone who came in and keep out the vagabonds. But as I mentioned before, with a staff of less than a dozen, his ability to carry out these activities were limited at best. The primary means of security for Henry were the yeomen of the guard, founded in 1485 by his father. These men were not nobles. They were to be, quote, good archers, hardy, strong, and of agility. Most were chosen for their size. A Venetian envoy in 1515 remarked how, quote, they were like giants. Armed with menacing halberds, these men cleared the road for Henry and stood guard at his court. But they weren't the only armed men at court. Every gentleman had the right to carry a sword, doing so while in the king's presence as well. There is little evidence of dueling in Henry's court, but multiple references to violence. Parliament tried to mitigate the risks to the royal person that such would bring by enacting stiff penalties for breaches of the peace. A man who struck another and drew blood within the, quote, verge of the court could be sentenced to a fine, imprisonment, and the loss of his right hand. Rather unsurprisingly, it cost the equivalent of over six million pounds just to feed the entire court every year. Entertainments and festivals were organized with maximum ceremony. Tudor feasts were truly extravaganzas of excess. These feasts alone cost around four million pounds per year, and up to 700 guests might be invited to one. There was definitely a pecking order at these spectacles. The choicest foods were first served to the top table, where the king sat, and then passed down 
Many of the feasts were actually served banquet style, with guests helping themselves after the servants had been dismissed. The king never slept alone, at least not alone in his bedchamber. A gentleman would always sleep at a pallet at the foot of his bed. Outside the chamber, several yeomen of the guard stood watch. If the king wished to sleep with his wife, he called for her, and she met him in an adjoining chamber. Two of his grooms would stand guard at the door to this chamber until the royal couple were ready to head back to their respective bedrooms. This probably seems like a rather odd situation to us today, but remember, the production of legitimate heirs was crucial to the success and well-being of the kingdom, so there had to be witnesses to consummation. During the summer of 1509, Henry, able to truly spread his wings for the first time, indulged himself in all the novel pleasures of kingship. For the first four years of his reign, Henry relied upon the ministers he had inherited from his father. These were older and more experienced men, which was a good thing because Henry had an aversion to paperwork in general and disliked the boring minutia of running a kingdom. Quote, Writing is to me somewhat tedious and painful, Henry once told Cardinal Wolsey. Henry was always ready for an excuse as to why he could not attend to state business. Sometimes it was a religious observance he had to make. Then he had to have supper first. Henry, in other words, was not a workaholic. Unfortunately for Henry's first advisors, they were at somewhat of a disadvantage when it came to giving advice to the young king. Henry much preferred younger men as advisors, and he very much wanted to be his own man. But on the other hand, fortunately for these men, Henry essentially left them alone for the first few years of his reign. And luckily for England, these were experienced counselors who had no issue at all running the kingdom. In 1509, the most powerful force in the Privy Council was Richard Fox, the man who had masterminded the smooth transition from Henry VII to his son. Power was centralized on the Privy Council throughout all of Henry's reign. At different times, this could mean either different men were in charge, Henry himself was in charge, or, especially late in his reign, various factions. Henry's first Lord Chancellor was William Warham, the Archbishop of Canterbury and friend of Erasmus. Fox's main rival on the council was the Lord Treasurer, Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey. Many men who early on sat on the Privy Council were ecclesiastical members of the Old Guard. By the end of Henry's reign, there were hardly any churchmen left for reasons we will definitely get into. In November 1509, the man chiefly responsible for this change, Thomas Wolsey, was appointed Lord High Almoner at the age of only 36. Graduating Oxford at only 15 years old, Wolsey had risen quickly through the Holy Orders, becoming chaplain to Henry VII in 1507. With the government firmly in the hands of these capable men, Henry considered himself free to enjoy the more pleasant and visual aspects of kingship. In order to maintain his magnificence, Henry took his recreation in public, often accompanied by an appropriate ceremony. The people of England loved Henry and adored seeing him. He was a welcome change from the miserly Henry VII, and the new king benefited from comparisons to his late father. It might have been nice if Henry had a bit more of his father in him, however. Henry's excesses quickly drained the royal treasury. Now, by and large, we can draw a line of demarcation around two decades into Henry's reign. For reasons that I'll talk more about in future episodes, after the 20-year mark, Henry grew less interested in courtly entertainments and spent more money on building projects. 
But during his first 20 years, well, it was all fun and games. Henry had an official in charge of organizing such pursuits. The Master of the Revels. He staged court entertainments, and he was a very busy man early on. Early Tudor drama consisted mostly of medieval miracle and morality plays, but these went out of style with the Reformation. In their place, pageants became wildly popular. These were entertainments involving mock battles, allegorical figures, and replete with the ideals of courtly love. Henry loved to join in on these spectacles, which was called disguising. Disguising, as the name implies, involved Henry and others dressing up in disguises, and then revealing their true self at some later point in the performance. Dancing was also very popular in Henry's court, as it was one of the few times that unmarried men and women might come into physical contact. Henry VIII was by all accounts an excellent and enthusiastic dancer. Catherine was also quite good and enjoyed dancing both at court with her ladies and in her own household. Everyone at court seemed to have loved gambling, and Henry even had a famous court jester, complete with the motley outfit and all that we imagined, named Patch. So that gives you an introduction to the world of Henry VIII and his initial first few years on the throne. Next week, I want to introduce a few of the characters who are going to play a major role in the first few pre-Reformation years of King Henry VIII and talk about a few of the challenges young Henry faced. <laughs>